Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Assistant Director for Biocomputing, Center for Genome Research and Biocomputing at Oregon State University, Chris Sullivan. Good morning. I'm going to talk to you today about porting software onto the Power Platform. I mean, we have all this wonderful hardware, but in the end, we really have to take advantage of it, and that's what the software does. We're going to move quickly through some of these slides because we have a bunch to go through. So back in the day, processing meant a bunch of equipment with a person standing there doing something. Today, processing means processors, on boards. This is where we get our work done. This is how we move forward. We've kind of given up that old method of, of processing with machines. Back in the day, storage meant a big box. You put it on a shelf. This is where we did things. Storage today means lots and lots of hard drive space. So we've actually changed the definitions as we go through time. And this is really important. Back in the day, memory meant your brain. And this is what we talked about. You, you basically leveraged it the best you could. Now we can mem manage memory a little bit differently. We can store things in this you know, volatile memory and, and, and let it come and go as we need. And it allows, more memory allows us to attack bigger problems. I work with a lot of researchers. This is what we do. And researchers need computers to help answer scientific questions. This is generally the look we get when we see our people working. And moving on to the Power Platform helped us change that, okay? So our users became very pleased with their pathway forward, and that's what we're here to talk to you about. Okay, so the Center for Genome Research and Biocomputing is a little bit more than just a genome research group. We've actually taken on almost all the research computing at Oregon State University, and we are underneath the research office. We do try and create methods and tools that fit our community. And we identified open power as a pathway forward for these new methods and tools. I'm going to talk about how we have to choose the proper operating system and then talk more clearly about building these tools on the open power systems. There are some problems, and they're inceded from groups like Intel. They try and make it so that everybody's biased to Intel. We found that. Um, and then we're going to talk about some examples of how we use them. So the CGRB works very hard with 26 departments at Oregon State University to build infrastructure for researchers, which is a little bit different than a standard infrastructure. Most infrastructures apply lots of policy, and policy affects the research question in a negative way. It changes the scope and introduces a bias. We have to help them create tools for data mining and data processing. We do build new algorithms. So I actually have students that we employ to do this. We create lots of deliverables. We publish stuff constantly. I put out three papers already this year and have already one accepted. One of the main things that we're here to talk about is ways of reducing cost and increasing the scope, and that's what the Power Platform gave us. So the center currently runs about 20,000 jobs a day. We have now, oh, we are closer to 5,000 processors at this point, I, I realized. We're over four petabytes of usable redundant storage. We generate four to eight terabytes of data a day from different groups. Um, we have lots of machines with greater than a terabyte of RAM because that helps us change the scope. We have six power systems. This is really important. We are continuing to buy them, and that's an important model. So how do these fit into the methods and tools around the open power? So open power really allowed us to increase the scope of the data that we can include in analysis, both in terms of thread and in terms of moving data across the bus. The bus speeds are really what changes and transforms our ability to work with data. I have groups that go out and mine data out of the ocean and they generate 80 terabytes of data a week. I have a quarter petabyte coming every month or so from owl sounds in the forest. So we have to try and reduce processing time from months to weeks, otherwise I will be impacted by data constantly, okay? We also need to run multiple tools at the same time so that we can converge into a single space and not run a single algorithm. This is really important, okay? Why so much storage? Man, we are in a data deluge. We are hemorrhaging data from sequencers, from video cameras, from microphones, from citizen science, from everything. It's out of control. So really, the, the movement right now is how to manage the data. And, and that's really what we're trying to do with these new technologies and these new platforms. 
Um, let's see, there's also lots and lots of steps within an analysis. One pipeline could have 15 to 20 steps, each step increasing the amount of output. Why such large memory machines? Scope. Okay, so I could have a single machine try and assemble the pine genome, and it would take six terabytes of RAM to help me do that, okay? So really, we're trying to leverage NVMe technologies and things like this to help us not have to buy really expensive memory systems and address these questions with lower cost, okay? Different algorithms use different amounts of memory and, and for analysis. And we also want to be able to start lots of jobs, and as we increase the thread count, we're decreasing the amount of memory per thread if we don't put that memory back on the machines. So we focus a lot on data mining and data processing, and a lot of this comes through initially high throughput sequencing and image analysis. So this is why we're so deeply embedded with groups like Illumina who create some of this um, sequencing technology and NVIDIA. NVIDIA heavily backs us for all of our image stuff. So we are massively processing image data constantly. We have groups that just take pictures of herds of, of, of animals going through the forests and stuff. So we work very hard on creating an infrastructure that researchers can take advantage of and they define the pathway forward. One of the key points of this we understood was enabling users to use the infrastructure without having to involve themselves with compiling or dealing with software. So literally we are lowering the activation energy for users to take advantage of this hardware by compiling the tools for them. We were able to put over 4,000 programs on our standard research cluster and as we brought online the power we realized we need to do the same thing over there. And so we began this process with an undergraduate who had paid $10 an hour. This is how easy it is to get this stuff to work. And he just sat for a month or two in compiling the software tools, and he came up to 2,000 programs in about two months. All right, that's, that's how easy it was. This student then continued on and started working with IBM, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. We have computational staff that will sit there and help our researchers bring online the tools that they need, compile the software, and we donate that time. Okay, so that is what enables our users. This is how our users don't even know that they're using power. They can just submit jobs and it finds the right stuff and it gets it done. Let's see. So let's talk about choosing the proper operating system. So in research, for us, it's all Linux. We don't, we don't even have Windows. We have Windows to run some, some pieces of data acquisition. That's about it. And right now, there was a big, big, big change for us that came through with the power, and this was Little Indian. We really were not interested in talking about power because of the fact that so many of the software packages were written in a context of Little Indian. Little Indian allowed us, when we moved to Power 8, to actually start embracing every single piece of open source research software and watch it work without any effort or any, any time. And so this one piece, I think, is the fundamental reason why everybody should start moving on to Power Platform. We can take advantage of this at little or no effort. Big Indian was, a, was the big separation we had back in the day with AIX. And, and I come from that time. I ran RS6000s. I remember our AIX. And, and ultimately, it was a phenomenal platform, but it didn't hold through time. And we had to move on, and I had to wait for IBM to come forward with this solution. This solution also happened from Apple. So Apple gave up and went to the Intel um, processor and it fundamentally revolutionized how Apple was selling their product. This is the key behind everything. So when we saw this happen, the CGRB became very excited and thought, wow, maybe we can actually use these machines for researchers. Maybe researchers can really take advantage of this bleeding edge hardware and move in new directions and finally go back to our heterogeneous environment. We really don't want to be sitting in the land of one architecture. So, we ultimately are a big CentOS shop. We also run Ubuntu. We really don't care. Our users tell us what we want to do. We try and conform our infrastructure around our users rather than asking our users to fit themselves into my infrastructure. This is how we enable people. So let's talk about compiling software. I'm gonna actually go through an example and we're gonna actually do it because it's that easy. It is so easy, it was dumbfounding. You can pay someone $10 an hour to do it. All right, so start at the beginning. Back in the day, there was this thing called AutoConf. 
And we all kind of forgot about it because of the fact that we became so Intel-centric that everybody just started off at dot slash configure make make install. But we really had this original concept of AutoConf where we had to identify the architecture. And so if we actually just went back and I told the student to type the word AutoConf, everything started to work. It was amazing. It was because we were not Intel. So in the end, when we look at stuff, here's two examples. You got an x86 and a PowerPC. They're running the exact same operating system. How phenomenal is that? It's phenomenal for my users. Look, I got the same version of GCC. Everything is the same. You literally are working under the same operating space. Autoconf is the same. Everything's the same. I mean, there's some little tidbits along the line, but in the end, you are basically able to just buy the machine, get out there, and start going. So there are some problems. <laughs> we noticed that some of the x86 stuff had Intel inseded in the IDEs SSE, SSE2 memory stuff. So in the end, users and developers had no idea that they were actually putting dependencies that were Intel specific into their code. Okay? And we've been able to communicate to some of those groups and then show them that their impact factor has been lost because they won't be able to take advantage of new technologies. And they've been going through recoding it and actually bringing their code in compliance with working across multiple architectures. And not just power, even Raspberry Pis, ARM, everything. Okay, oh, let's, yeah, well, we can't go back. Let's keep going forward. There was also one little option that we realized is that lots of the coders still had to be able to put something in there that allowed it to understand that there was a build type. And so we actually used the build type in there of PowerPC64. So we're going to run through an actual compile here on both sides doing the exact same program and show you that it basically looks exactly the same. This is what really excited us. When we realized that we could just sit there and get all of our software ported onto this new architecture, my users just started using it. And I'm gonna talk a little later in the afternoon about how we created a truly heterogeneous infrastructure for my users to just blindly submit jobs. They don't care what machine it goes to because all the software is already there and it is able to identify the architecture and give them the correct environment variables. Okay, so as we work through here, we actually are just building the same piece of software. And, uh, and we keep going. You get more threads on the other power, so it gets to go faster, as always. Our users submitted jobs, and as their jobs started going, they realized very quickly, hey, these power machines are finishing the jobs a lot faster, and we can send a lot more jobs at them. And so the scaling really started to occur. My users started thinking about how to take advantage of this space and change the way that they did their research. So there you go. It all works. And that's literally the amount of time it took my student. And so he just sat there doing this for hours. And uh, it, he had a lot of fun with it in the end. Um, in many cases, it's really just this easy. Um, we just go through and we just keep compiling software. We continue forward still to this day. Um, 70 to 80% just compile with cake. They don't, they don't take any effort at all. Um, ones that have problems are x86 specific and they're Intel libraries that are MMX or SSE. Um, many times threading is really where you get the advantage from IBM, I, from the power. IBM and, uh, and, and the group ultimately took my student as an intern and worked with him to take all those 2000 programs and create build scripts. So now any of the researchers in the research community can just pull down build scripts and watch the tools work on power. So we've really kind of broadened the impact around the research community to start taking advantage of this technology. Um, we just started deploying Power8 in our infrastructure because our users loved it so much and they realized that they didn't have to do anything to actually take advantage of it. And we actually buy the Minsky machines now and we really enjoy having GPUs that are part of the system bus so that that way we can actually move data across them in ways we've never done before. We also tested things in the CAPI space. So um, we tested some stuff where we were able to take advantage of this CAPI technology and we were able doing, we actually worked on a gzip card um, where we were able to take 70 hours of gzip work that was CPU based and turn it into less than an hour's worth of time on a card. This is the bandwidth we're talking about. 
This reinvents my file space so my users don't have to keep spending money. It's incredible the bandwidth through these things. Oh, the NVLink. So NVLink allowed us to finally start moving data through the GPUs. And putting the GPU onto the motherboard fundamentally changed our interaction with data. I actually am able to put 60 terabytes of data through GPUs like it's nothing at this point in time. So it really brought the GPU forward and into a position where we can use it for processing of real large data sets. Finally, I work very closely with Lance in OSU OSL, who's been a, a big member of Open Power for a long time. And Lance and I have been working very hard to create an environment for all developers in the entire world to take advantage of this platform. So we actually brought online three Minsky machines, and Lance and I have deployed them with P100s on them, so developers in the research community and the general community can just start porting all their software. And we have a lot of groups in this space doing this, and um, ultimately, we can get people on the GPUs, we can get them into the CAPI, we got NV, uh, NVMe flashcards in there, we have all kinds of stuff. We have them connected with Mellanox switches where we can actually move the data across the switch between the NVMEs. It's really impressive. So, groups like Julia, GeneMark, Diamond, we even have Unova, lots and lots of groups have actually come in and actually started developing on this platform and considered a continu continuous development environment. So in summary, computational <laughs> science really does run a gamut of research. We don't really know where we're gonna go tomorrow and that's what's exciting. That's what the P Open Power Platform provides us. It's a pathway to know that we're gonna succeed regardless of what comes at me. So new technologies can change computational science. This is what we're trying to do. We don't wanna become stagnant. I have to move forward. Okay, new technologies require changes in tools and hardware. This is what we do. We have to be able to implement this new hardware and it's our responsibility to lower that activation energy and allow the users to take advantage of it almost like they don't even know they're in there, okay? So with that, I will invite Scott Schultz from Mellanox up and hopefully he can elaborate some more on this.